Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. The label of she-wolf is one that has been attached to a few women in our history, as Helen Castor's fabulous book and related documentary series have already beautifully set out. Today though, we're going to take a close look at one of these she-wolves. So, Let's explore the life and legacy of Isabella, the so-called she-wolf of France. Isabella was born in 1295. Her father was Philip IV of France. He was also known as Philip the Fair. Her mother was Joan, Queen of Navarre. When Isabella was around two or three years old, it was suggested that she marry the son and heir of King Edward I of England. This was Edward of Carnarvon. Their marriage was suggested to form part of an Anglo-French treaty. Edward of Carnarvon had been born on the 25th of April 1284 at Carnarvon Castle, hence the name that he was being known by at this time. And thus... Edward of Carnarvon was around 11 years older than Isabella. This couple were formally betrothed in the spring of 1303, which would have made Isabella around seven, but probably about to turn eight. Now, on a connected side note, William Wallace, also known in the world of film as Braveheart, was executed on the 23rd of August, 1305. So that means at a time when Isabella was around 10 years old, and still living in France. King Edward I died on the 7th of July 1307, and his son succeeded him to become King Edward II. At once, he set about attempting to find ways to stabilise his new place as king. A diplomatically advantageous marriage, followed by a joint coronation, would certainly have been seen as a good start, and so. Isabella and Edward were married at Boulogne, on the 25th of January 1308. Isabella would be turning 13 later that year, while Edward would be turning 24. Prior to this wedding, Isabella's father had successfully negotiated an increase in his daughter's dower assignment from Edward. But the dispute over Aquitaine, which Edward was the Duke of, rumbled on. These disputes would, however, not be the only source of tension in relation to this union, though. By the time Isabella was crowned, alongside her husband at Westminster Abbey on the 25th of February 1308, Edward had caused offence. This was due to the preferential treatment that he had shown to his favourite, Piers Gaveston. I have made a video on Edward II's favourites that I will be leaving linked. Edward II had chosen to leave Gaveston as his regent while he made the journey to marry Isabella and then bring her back to England as his wife and queen. Edward had chosen to send their wedding gifts to Gaveston. At the coronation, Gaveston had been permitted to carry the crown of St Edward the Confessor into the abbey before the king. Gaveston also redeemed the katana sword and placed the spur on King Edward's left foot during this ceremony. And going further still, at the celebrations after this coronation, Gaveston peacocked about the place in the very finest clothes and monopolised the king's attention. Isabella's uncles, Charles and Louis, were at this coronation and they were furious at the disrespect that was being shown to their niece. Isabella herself was seemingly similarly unimpressed. Now, she was young, but let's remember that Isabella had been born and raised to be royal. From her very earliest years, she would have been taught how to be a queen consort and a mother of future kings. She would have been made keenly aware of her role and her responsibilities, but also of her rights and prerogatives. Gaveston, she no doubt would have been well able to recognise, was behaving in a way that made him akin to a usurper 
of her rightful place. If we fast forward to the 16th century to take a look at Christopher Marlowe's play Edward II, we soon see that the audience is, at first at least, presented with a very sympathetic portrayal of Isabella. We meet her at this moment following the forced exile of Gaveston. Now, this would otherwise have been a cause for Isabella to celebrate. However, Marlowe presents us with a queen who is being blamed for the misfortunes of her husband and his favourite. This is a queen who is being abandoned and reviled. She delivers the following speech. Quote, O miserable and distressed queen, would, when I left sweet France and was embarked, that charming Circe, walking on the waves, had changed my shape, or, at the marriage day, the cup of Hymen had been full of poison, or with those arms that twined about my neck I had been stifled, and not lived to see the king my lord thus to abandon me. Like frantic Juno, will I fill the earth with ghastly murmur of my sighs and cries. For never doted Jove on Ganymede, so much as he on cursed Gaveston. But that will more exasperate him. I must entreat him. I must speak him fair and be a means to call home Gaveston. And yet he'll ever dote on Gaveston. And so am I forever miserable. However, Isabella did manage to carve out a place for herself as Edward's queen. The traditional role of queen as intercessor was one example, one way in which she was able to do this, because Edward II would often bestow pardons, favour and rewards in the way that she requested and directed. Additionally, although no children were born in the early years of their marriage, it has been suggested that this may have had as much to do with Isabella's youth at the point of their marriage as it did with Edward's reported preference for Gaveston's bed. Because sure enough, Isabella and Edward's first child, a son, named Edward, like his father, was born on the 13th of November 1312, when Isabella was around 17 years old. When she had been in the early months of this first pregnancy, Piers Gaveston was captured and killed by his enemies. He was beheaded by them on the 19th of June, 1312. As for the royal couple, more children would follow. John was born just over three years after the birth of Edward, on the 15th of July, 1316. Eleanor followed in July, 1318, and then Joan was born in June, 1321. Edward II may have complained that this marriage had not resulted in the precise expected peace between France and England. Isabella may have been mortified by her husband's more rustic pursuits. Apparently the king liked to row his own boats, dig his own ditches and thatch his own roofs. These were pastimes that he had begun while still a prince. And all of this, for some reason, led some people to insinuate that he was not really the son of King Edward I. Nevertheless, it was Isabella who was at Edward's side, showing support for his national and international policies. Isabella was attempting to smooth relations between her husband and his barons, just as she was working to realise a peace with France. Before long, though, she would be faced with an even greater challenge, and to her and to her honour, an even greater affront than that that had ever been presented by Piers Gaveston. Because by the late 1310s, there was a father and son duo on the scene. I'm talking about the Dispensers, who I do also discuss in that video on Edward's favourites that I'm going to be leaving linked in my description box. These Dispensers were in flaming tensions, both in the royal marriage and also in the royal court as a whole. As the threat of civil war loomed, Isabella adopted the traditional and expected posture of queenly intercession. She knelt before her husband and begged with him to make peace. She wanted him to come to terms with the very barons 
who were calling for the exile of his new favourites, the Dispensers. Edward was most displeased by this intervention on the part of his wife. This displeasure did not, however, prevent Edward from taking action when Isabella was refused entry to Leeds Castle in Kent on the 13th of October 1321. As a result of this refusal of access, the Queen's party became involved in a fight in which a number of her men were killed. It has been suggested that Edward had wanted to generate this conflict in order to justify him taking violent action against all of those nobles that had ranged against him and his favourites. As it would turn out, Edward would get what he wanted, namely the dispensers by his side. As for Isabella, she soon found that her access to her husband was being reduced. And then, as tensions with her native France increased, she found that she was being approached with distrust, as if she were nothing more than an enemy agent on English soil. Soon the order was given that her lands should be seized. Her access to money would be reduced. Her household was to be pared back. Indeed, her friends from France were sent away and those who remained were there to spy on her and surveil her. Her influence over her children was deemed suspect and so her contact with them was also reduced. It has been suggested that Isabella's behaviour over the next few years, in the face of this frankly fairly profound insult, lulled her husband and the dispensers into a false sense of safety. It led them to believe that she had been sufficiently humbled and that she would do exactly as she was told. And perhaps this was her intention during this time, that she feigned compliance until she could see a way to alter her situation. However, it is of course also possible that Edward and the dispensers were simply seeing what they wanted to see in the hopes that they might be able to alleviate what looked like an ever-worsening situation. Because in 1324, a French army that was being led by Isabella's uncle took control of Edward's ducal lands in Aquitaine. In response to this, Edward then launched an attack on Aquitaine in the hopes of asserting his rights there. Now, conflict is an expensive business and it's also a dangerous one. It's all the more dangerous if the monarch that is engaging in that overseas conflict happens to have a rebellion-minded nobility at home. So, Isabella presents herself as a loyal, biddable intercessor who can work with the King of France, who was, of course, by this point, her brother Charles IV, in March 1325. Isabella, along with her now restored household, travelled to Paris to discuss peace. Her brother Charles was prevailed upon to agree to accept the homage of Isabella and Edward's eldest son, Edward, following that boy's elevation to the titles of Duke of Aquitaine and Count of Ponthieu. So, with all that being done, the heir of England was sent to join his mother in Paris in the September of 1325, and I'm sure no one is going to be surprised to learn that after this, with her son by her side, Isabella refused to obey her husband's command for her to return to England. Her brother supported her in this refusal. Brother and sister were calling for the exile of the dispensers from England on the premise that Isabella's life would be under threat from them and indeed from Edward, which in fairness it could well have been. At this time, France was also playing host to certain disaffected, displeased, indeed outright angry English barons people who had fled the English regime or who had been forced into exile by it. One of them was a man called Roger Mortimer. Isabella and Roger soon became lovers and before long they were making plans to return to England and take control there. At the start of 1326, Isabella arranged a tactically advantageous marriage for her eldest son, Edward. He married Philippa of Hainaut. She came with a dowry that served to be more than sufficient to hire a substantial mercenary fighting force. On the 24th of September 1326, Isabella, 
accompanied by numerous English exiles and also that mercenary fighting force, made landfall in England. As Isabella moved through the country, she was met with little resistance and indeed much support, both in terms of fighting men prepared to join up with her and also in terms of people prepared to fund her and her army. By the 15th of October, London came out in support of Isabella. Edward II fled with the dispensers. They were pursued. Isabella had her by now almost 14-year-old son proclaimed England's guardian on the 26th of October. And on this same day, Isabella accepted the submission of Bristol and, I can only assume, experienced relief when she heard the news that Dispenser the Elder had been caught and executed. Edward II and Dispenser the Younger were taken on the 16th of November with Dispenser the Younger being executed nine days later on the 25th of November. Edward II was encouraged, or perhaps that should be, was enforced to abdicate from his throne in favour of his teenage son. This happened at the start of the next year, 1327, and the coronation of King Edward III took place on the 1st of February. This new king was 14 years old. There were plots that sought to free Edward II and return him to his throne, and Isabella would almost certainly have recognised that her husband was a continuing source of danger in her life. We aren't sure exactly how it happened. But on the 21st of September, 1327, it was announced that Edward II had died at Berkeley Castle almost certainly, I think, as a result of foul play, something that had no doubt been orchestrated by those who were responsible for wrestling the crown away from him in the first place. Christopher Marlowe would immortalise the accounts of Edward's death that were set down in the chronicles of the day, including Hollinshed's chronicle. According to these accounts, and indeed according to the play, Edward II's death was caused by a red-hot poker being forced into his fundament and up through his bowels. It was suggested that this method of death was chosen in order to avoid there being visible marks of violence that could be found on Edward's body. So in turn, the new regime could feasibly say that this former king had died of natural causes, which of course, it's entirely possible he did do, however convenient that would have been. Nevertheless, this same natural appearing result could, as an example, be obtained by simply denying the prisoner anything to drink. There is no need to involve the red-hot poker. Instead, I believe that it was designed to be a form of posthumous shaming for the offence, as it would have been seen during the period, of sodomy. So these accounts then are an attempt to make it seem that Edward II received a justifiable punishment that befitted his crimes. Edward III may have been king, but it was his mother Isabella and her lover Mortimer that actually ruled in his place. Now, a key reason that Edward II's favourites had been so unpopular, and by extension had made the king himself unpopular, was because of their greedy acquisition of lands, revenues and authority. Isabella and Mortimer soon started to make the mistake of replicating this behaviour themselves. They, like the previous regime, would soon garner the ire of the warlike barons. Then, on the night of the 19th of October 1330, a group that was being led by King Edward III, who was by this point around a month shy of his 18th birthday, managed to sneak into Nottingham Castle and surprise Isabella and Mortimer. The following day, on October 20th, 1330, King Edward III issued a proclamation that he had taken the government of his realm into his own hands. The next month saw the execution of Roger Mortimer as a traitor. As for Isabella... A brief period of being held under guard soon gave way to life as a respected queen dowager. This was a comfortable life, one with ample funds, 
albeit funds that would have been reduced from that which she had seized during the early years of her son's reign. She would be surrounded by the expected luxuries such as befitted one of her rank. She was welcomed to her son's court for important moments. She was permitted to maintain a network of friends that would keep her informed of both national and international affairs. And on top of this, during her final months, she enjoyed the company of her youngest daughter, Joan. Isabella died on the 23rd of August, 1358, when she would have been around 63 years old. At her request... She was buried in the mantle that she had worn at her wedding to King Edward II. She was also laid to rest holding his heart. Well, what do you think of the life and legacy of Isabella of France? Do you think that she earned that name, She-Wolf? In relation to that last question, I think it might be helpful for me to share the following passage from Isabella's biographer, John Carmi Parson. Of her reputation, he writes, quote, A reasoned estimate of Isabella's career is impeded by the ambiguities of her reputation. Impressed by her high lineage, beauty and tribulations, contemporaries regarded her as a lovely, tragic queen. The epithet she-wolf of France, first used by Shakespeare for Margaret of Anjou, was applied to Isabella only in the 18th century. What do you think motivated her to request that she be buried with her husband's heart and wearing her wedding mantle? Was it guilt? Hypocrisy? A desire to be viewed positively by those around her or by posterity? What about the way that her son treated her following his full assumption of royal control? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comment section underneath this video. But I would also love it if you'd pop an emoji or a social glyph in the comments too, because the more engagement a video gets, the more YouTube recognises it as a video that people are enjoying and liking, and that then makes them share it out further. That's going to help us to grow this community. In terms of emoji slash social glyph, let's do something either wolfy or French. You pick. In fact, if you think Isabella was a she-wolf, find a wolf emoji. If you think she was just a queen, try a queen emoji or a French flag. You can also find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to all of the places you can find me on the internet in my description box. Please do consider following me over on some or all of those so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope that you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, why not share it with your friends? In fact, if you like my channel, please do let your pals know about it too. And you can let me know that you like this video in particular by hitting the thumbs up please do subscribe to the channel. And if you think you're subscribed, have a little check right now. Make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you against your will. While you are there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, please do hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down menu that will appear so that allegedly, they claim, YouTube will tell you when I have next uploaded and also when I am planning to go live. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.